Good evening and welcome to this special edition of The Journey Home. Hello, I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. This is a Journey Home roundtable, but it's a special roundtable because we're here outside of Oslo, Norway, in a wonderful uh, convent, Luden Convent, of the Dominican nuns who are dedicated to Our Lady of the Annunciation. They've been extending great hospitality to us as we film these programs. And in this roundtable, this first half of tonight's program, we're going to focus on in many ways, a unique situation here in Norway, and that is the multiculturalism, both of the country as well as the church. And I've been invited to join us for this roundtable, three who are both very much involved in this issue of multiculturalism here in Norway. Our first guest was on the journey home in one of our tapings, Father, excuse me, per, not Father yet, right? Yes. Uh, per Kvarna, though studying for the priesthood, and Father Clement. And I'm going to have you say your name in a little bit. I'm sure that I won't do a very good job of it, Father. I am Clement Inpanaden Amidanade. I am coming from Sri Lanka, so I am working in a bishop house in Oslo. All right, thank you very much. And then for Father Arne Marco Kirsbom. Yes. Thank you, Father Arne, for joining us here. And your position here in the diocese is? I am the Vicar General of the diocese, so I am working everywhere. <laughs> All the groups, the different yes. groups that, that are here. Normally on our round tables, I invite the guests just to take another moment or so as we begin to let the audience know a little bit about your own spiritual journey. And uh, Per, why don't we begin with you, because you've already been a guest on the journey home, if you want. Well, um, I was uh, raised in a, in a Lutheran family, like uh, most Norwegians, in fact, at least of my generation. <laughs> And, um, well, in a very, what shall I say, unspectacular way, um, I, uh, my, my uh, academic career was uh, in the uh, history of religions, and I specialized in Buddhism. And I think that also contributed to opening my eyes to the importance of the spiritual life in general, in, in, in human life. Um, about 10 years ago, I uh, realized that I... Uh, wanted to, in fact, that I had to become a Catholic. Uh, it was indeed uh, a coming home experience, as with so many other people. And um, uh, later, um, I have been able to take early retirement from the university. And um, being a widower, I am now um, preparing for the priesthood, as you said. At the request of the bishop? At the request of the bishop. All yes. right. Well, that's, we'll pray for you. I mean, that's a great, great request then. You've received because you still got to study for it, right? Oh yes, yes. <laughs> I'm struggling with Greek at the moment. Oh, there you go. Well, you're a language man, so that should be easy for you. Father Clement. Yes. How about your early? Yes, uh, I was born in Sri Lanka, so my education and other academic qualification was in Sri Lanka. So I did. So I got a bachelor degree in philosophy and also other bachelor degree in theology, and then I was ordained in Sri Lanka. All right. So after my initial uh, priesthood, uh, the first year priesthood, I was sent to uh, Oslo in Norway to work among the Tamil immigrants in Oslo in or Norway. So I am presently working, uh, working for the Tamils who are immigrated already in uh, Norway due to war situation mm. mainly. And also some people, uh, Tamils, also came as a study purpose also here. So at the moment, I'm, I am uh, helping my bishop administration and also um, do my job with the Tamil people. Now the Tamil people, when they came, were they already Catholic? Uh, most of the Tamil people are Hindus. Okay. And now um, there are 14,000 Tamils are here. Mm. Uh, it is registered. Only the 4,000 Catholics are here. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Father. Father Arne. Yes. How about your own spiritual journey? How did you come, especially to become Vicar General? Probably something you didn't dream of as a child, but uh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you have to ask the bishop about that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, no, well, uh, I was actually uh, raised Catholic in Norway. I have a mother from Austria. So I was baptized here in the cathedral. Okay. And, uh, well, I grew up as a normal child in Norway. We, my brothers and I, we were the only Catholics in school. So we had all this to explain to the others about Catholic faith and <laughs> spirituality. 
And I participated always in the cadet uh, cases of my parish. Uh, and uh, during the studies to be civil engineer, I discovered the possibility of having a vocation. So after finishing uh, the engineering studies, I entered the congregation of the Sacred House Fathers of Jesus and Mary in the German province. So I was many years in Germany studying and also working the first years as a priest and came back to Norway. But also been uh, to Spain and South America. And uh, since we got our new bishop in 2005, he asked me to be his vicar general and I started it the 1st of January 2006. All right. So you've just been a couple years in that position. Is, yes, I now, the bishop also has okay. been a couple of years only. <laughs> All right. Yes. It, we've been hearing on our interviews as well as um, a roundtable that we had previously. First of all, the, the uniqueness of the vocations here, I mean, there may be eight, but per capita, that's, that's very high. And that's, that's, but also I've been hearing the challenge about Catholics spread out all over the country, very small percentage in the challenge that offers for the diocese, uh, for, the, for the priests. And like you said yourself, I mean, you, brought, you and your brother brought up uh, the only Catholics in, in public school. But this particular issue of multiculturalism is, I found as a surprise when I came here. I didn't realize. So how about let's introduce our audience to that issue. Explain this, can, this unique situation here in Norway, if, if you would. Well, I think it's mainly a reality for us in the Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. And actually, we, we did uh, come back after the Reformation as a foreigner church. In 1843, when the first Catholics uh, had their first mass here in Oslo, they were only foreigners. So actually we have already, always since then been a church also of multicultural uh, f- aspect. Only the first hundred years, it was a very slow development and we had converts also from Norwegians. But it was very slowly development, and after the actually Second Vatican Council, uh, the 60s, uh, then they started to come very many people. The, For example, what, if well, you, what, uh, well, what are the groups that are, are, are in large numbers here that have come to Norway? There are Polish group. It is uh, acting in a large number here. Mm-hmm. So there, there are the Vietnam group or. Uh, Tamils or Philippines, people from Philippines. Mm-hmm. Also, like uh, more than 15 groups in our church. It is very important that we trust here that our bishop and our administration they create a good environment to welcome all the groups mm-hmm. and also create a um, good environment also to help the, the need of these uh, different groups. Also, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I could also add that. Um, uh, in, in the larger towns, especially in Oslo, it is possible to cater to the various uh, um, linguistic and, and um, ethnic and national groups like Filipinos and, um, and Croatians, Polish, etc. Um, but um, in, the, in the countryside or in the smaller towns, this is obviously not possible, but you still have the same diversity, uh, only in much smaller numbers. And this creates um, quite, uh, quite serious problems for the local parish priests, how to, how to provide um, uh, you know, uh, mass catechesis, etc., and to, at the same time to, to uh, integrate uh, the Norwegian um, oh, let's say the older Norwegian um, part, section of the church uh, um, with the uh, relatively speaking newcomers. Um, this is, this is a, it's a problem uh, which is easier to deal with in the big cities, obviously, than in the smaller uh, centers. Yeah, I, th- I think also the sp- special thing about Norway for us as Catholics are that uh, we are a small group in Norway. We are officially about one to two percent of the population. Maybe with all the unregistered, we could be about three to four percent. But among us, I would say at least eighty-five to ninety percent are not Norwegians. So when 
huge groups are coming from other countries and are Catholic, for us it's a huge uh, okay. challenge because we are growing <laughs> of a sudden very fast and we don't know how to meet all the needs. You know, because, of course, you can say Norwegian is the language of everyone living in Norway, so that uh, would be nice if everyone could speak it. But the people are coming and it take some years to be good in Norwegian and we want to meet them in the early stage of their life here and therefore we are trying to get priests from many countries to offer masses and pastoral care in their own language. The languages, it seems like, first of all, one of the biggest issues, I noticed when I visited the Fram Museum and uh, the displays, as you went around, each picture was in eight languages uh, <laughs> underneath, but when I went upstairs, there was a photograph, but it was in English only. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're falling back on as a more common language, English, or are you working first hard to, to teach them Norwegian? And how are you addressing that issue? And, well, no, uh, I think everyone is urged to learn Norwegian. Of course. But we in Norway do learn very much English right. in our education. I'm so very normally, I, I wouldn't have around at all. <laughs> but there are many countries where they are not very good in English. Ah, okay. And for them, uh, it's mainly important that they speak uh, at least Norwegian in Norway. Mm -hmm. But of course, for us, it's uh, no problem okay. normally if there's all, only English. We, we, we do understand mostly English. Okay. When, I see a, when I say personally, when I came here, I didn't, I didn't feel that I was lost because I know, since I know the English, right. I was able to, uh, uh, to move with others also. But I was uh, strongly instructed that I, I, I would uh, learn the language in order that because if uh, now I feel that I, I learned the little, uh, I can say the mass and I can preach also. Now I can, I am very happy and also I can also say to others also, if I don't study the language, it is really for us as a minister, it's difficult to understand our people also. For example, our for parents have children also. If I want to understand the children in their culture, in their way of living, I should learn the language. That is the thing, yeah. Are, in your case, yeah. your your country, yeah. your church at home sent you yes. to be the pastor of your unique group in Norway. Is that common? Uh, uh, more than that, uh, our bishop invites, and the bishop knows the need for the, these people, and the, he feels then the people need the, uh, the ministry or the liturgy in their own language. So he invites priests. Also, our father also said already, mm -hmm. the, now Bishop is inviting many priests from various language groups and also make them people to feel in their own uh, uh, culture and the language. Yeah. Normally, in bigger Catholic countries, the bishops' conference will have one of the bishops as responsible for their own foreigners in other countries. Mm -hmm. But it's very different how they are actually following it up. For instance, in Chile, they do have a bishop for, for uh, Chileans in other countries. And normally, they will come every four or five years to Norway or to Sweden and mm -hmm. visit uh, their own people and but of course we would like to have even more priests because there are so many groups there are so many languages and it's difficult for us as Norwegians or from other countries to help out <laughs> I'd like to follow up that point uh, which also has to do with diversity but also a, there's also a diversity within uh, let's say, the, the ethnically Norwegian uh, population in this country, uh, in the sense that I already mentioned the problem in smaller towns um, in, throughout the country, uh, but also um, in, in the actual countryside outside the towns, uh, there is in Norway a fairly large population living you know, on farm and farmsteads, often quite spread out with long distances and and um, no regular access to uh, to churches, etc., if they are Catholics. And um, I, I'm involved in uh, one such rural area, uh, about uh, 250 kilometers or 160 miles uh, northwest of Oslo. Um, and what we see in this area is that um, 
all the time, uh, individuals are sort of turning up and they're saying, oh, uh, we didn't realize that now, because in this area now, there is a mass being uh, celebrated every third week. And we didn't realize that this was happening. And yeah, we are Catholics, and uh, uh, maybe they come along, or maybe they don't, but um, they've actually been living there for uh, maybe a large part of their life without n any real um, uh, regular contact with their own church. So this is also an aspect of, of the, uh, the situation, I think. Are the groups, uh, in your experience, are, yeah. when they come, do they usually congregate in one area? What brings them way out to the countryside, as Pear is talking about? I, I mean, that would seem to be particularly difficult if you're not quite familiar with the language or the culture and you come from a radically different culture. Are, are you seeing both and? and yeah, yeah. Well, many do, of course, seek to stay in the bigger cities. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if they are coming from big cities in other countries, they will feel more at home in a big city. But, for instance, you have many Norwegians married to Filipino women, for, just as an example. And they can come from everywhere and get a woman to their place that can also be everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so you will have uh, that situation that you have uh, one Catholic here, one Catholic there, living somewhere on the countryside. I myself, at the moment, I have the responsibility for two parishes in the diocese. And this weekend I will go to the parish of Hamar, 120 kilometers from Oslo, and visit a group in Alvdal that are still 200 more kilometers within the same parish. And there, up there, you will have around 30 Catholics from different countries, and some of them, 10 to 15, will come to the Mass. And I do that every five, six weeks at the moment. No? And, and that's also a huge challenge. One thing is to integrate all the foreigners mostly living in the bigger cities, but also to connect all the single ones or poor ones living outside, far away from the cities. Yeah? We have both situations, actually. And most of them are living far from the cities are also foreigners, not necessarily Norwegians. Are the priests being uniquely prepared for this task? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? We try, but... Uh, uh, if you come, you don't a, have a seminary of your own yet, do yes. you? No. We are no founding. Uh, we are oh, we are. There we are. We're building one up now. Mm -hmm. and, okay. Uh, they will uh, be more uh, used to it in the future. But of course, if you are coming as a priest from a Catholic country where everyone is Catholic, <laughs> and there are priests everywhere, and all of a sudden you have to take care of people, ten, fifteen, twenty, living far away, you have to use the whole day just to say mass for ten persons. Mm -hmm. It's a very big difference, and it's not always easy for a priest to manage the very different situation of pastoral care. You know? they, they have to learn that, how to do it. You know? And the people themselves have to be um, uh, sympathetic to the challenge of their priest. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I mean, Indeed. That's a special, special... What about resources for all these different people? Uh, I mean, you have one Bible in Norwegian, but now you have people of all these different languages. Are the resources available here in Norway for all these Catholics? Not for everyone, but for many, I think. Well, for the larger groups, uh, I would imagine they are available. I'd like to pick up one point which was just touched on, um, namely uh, the, uh, the, the Polish community in this mm. country, because that is the one community which has really grown just, it's almost like an explosion during the last mm. five years or yeah. so. And uh, I, I believe that it's now calculated, there are no absolutely sure figures, but that there are something like 100,000 Polish workers working in Norway in various fields, a lot of them working in construction work and so on. Now, uh, the uh, special challenge there is that uh, they are mainly uh, men working here uh, on short-term or medium-term uh, uh, conditions, um, you know, for one year or two, three, four, five years, um, and they're not here with their families. And that is a challenge, how to provide, in fact, not just uh, uh, liturgical services and so on, but, mm -hmm. but special services for, for a large group in this special situation. Of course, gradually they are 
some of them do bring their families here and they find permanent work and they settle down. Um, but I imagine most of them um, s- plan to return to Poland, you know, after some time, when, if they can get good jobs back in in their own country. So, how to deal with this is is a quite a challenge and a big problem actually. And there are masses said every day, I believe now in Oslo in Polish, yes. um, and on Sundays in several masses in various churches. Um, but there are also other aspects of this problem. I was thinking that the, uh, you know, the Lord uh, led the church in the Vatican Council to open the mass to the vernacular. I mean, so you know, we, we, that's the guidance of the Spirit. We don't deny that or, or, uh, or question that. But a you, you know, hundred years ago, if this were happening, it'd be a bit different because the mass would be in Latin. The priests would have been trained in Latin. So it wouldn't matter where you're coming from. You would all celebrate together. But we, we do see you know, the rising interest in the Latin. Is that a help here, that interest in Latin, or is it the same issue? Most of the priests don't have that background. Or... Well, I, th- I think in, in many countries they are not used to Latin at all anymore. Mm-hmm. You know? in, in Norway we have always maintained at least uh, the uh, um, songs of the Mass or the right. um, fixed parts uh, in Latin. So we are more used to that, Gloria, Credo, and Mm-hmm. And to sing that, but in many countries they never hear hear Latin anymore. Of course, 50 years ago it would have been easy because everyone would have known Latin or been used to the same mass. You know? Now we have the, the issue with all these uh, languages. But I, I not I, I do not think that uh, it will be a kind of renaissance of the Latin. I don't think that there is a certain interest, but I think that's more for people interested in tradition or in interested in. Uh, L- Latin as a language, yeah. also, no, but I, I don't think that it uh, will be a help in that way. Sadly, no, it would have been very much easier for us <laughs> in many aspects. And it is uh, true, no, that we spoke about we speak about the inculturalization no, after Vatican II. So when we say in our own language, that is very rich, no, for the yeah. people. Also, they can they can come out with their own culture and the language, their feelings to towards God, the, the relationship with God, they can uh, very easily build up. So otherwise, if you if we have another language, also for example, Latin, it was there for in our church. Uh, it is like something uh, in. Uh, uh, keeping away from us, from God also sometimes. So when we say, uh, when we do our um, services or other liturgical thing in, our, in their own language, it will be very rich also. Yeah, it will be very helpful also. Are you experiencing evangelization within the different groups as they come here to Norway? Uh, you know, those, let's say, from your group who were not Catholic when they came here. Yes. Are you seeing some interest in the Catholic faith? Uh, you mean the evangelization? Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, when we uh, speak about the evangelization, we also, there are two uh, norms, no? the re-evangelization and the evangelization to the, the people who don't, who don't know the Jesus before. No? The right. first time they are going to listen. No? But mainly for us, the re-evangelization, no? Uh, for the people who already have the faith, and at the same time, they also, uh, due to other uh, various circumstances, they missed uh, or lost their faith. So we had to strengthen their faith. So that is a re And we already started that. The, our bishop also, uh, two years back, he trust on that point, uh, yeah. the ev- evangelization, or two years yes. back. So we did also. But, uh, what we do also see is that <clears throat> it's very different from culture to culture, how the people will seek the church, if they will seek the church. Mm-hmm. No, that's not uh, given that everyone is has the equal interest in having contact with the church, and that's also a challenge for us. And we have also a situation that the reason why the people came to Norway, because it has often something to do with a conflict in the home uh, culture. Mm-hmm. 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 They are escaping from something at mm-hmm. time. No, for, for instance, in the 70s, they came many from Chile because of the dictatorship, dictatorship mm-hmm. of Pinochet. Right? Right. So they, they would be right on the left side of the politics, let us say, mm-hmm. like that, no? when they came mm-hmm. to Norway. In, in Vietnam, they escaped a communist regime 
to have the freedom of practice as Catholicism, for instance, or yeah. Buddhism. Right. And those two groups have big difficulties to understand each other here, mm. because the reasons to leave their own countries were so different. And then, <coughs> during the years, you will get different members of the different conflict groups of their own home countries to Norway. And that's also very difficult for us to understand and to see how to help the groups to reintegrate also among themselves. <coughs> well, thank <coughs> all three of you for sharing on this very unique issue of Norway. Though we're all of us around the world experiencing the same, as the you know, internet and everything brings us together, we see a lot of immigration. So thank you, all three of you, for helping us understand maybe specifically how we can uh, pray more for Norway and the needs of the church here in Norway. So thank you all three very much. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back for the second part of this program when we look at the issue of evangelization and ecumenism. See you in a bit. Welcome back to this special episode of The Journey Home, this roundtable filmed outside of Oslo, Norway. And our topic for the second half of the hour is a, a, a continuation, but yet very different, and that's the idea of, of ecumenism and evangelization here in Norway. And we have a, a new panel with us, uh, Heidi Uma. Is that More is that, or less. Okay, I'm <laughs> yeah. sorry. Um, okay, thank you for joining us on The Journey Home. And uh, Father Radar, welcome back uh, to the program. And Father, I mean, uh, Sister Anna uh, Lisa Strum, welcome back. And uh, again, thank you for all the hospitality you've given us here in your cloister, very much so. Every journey, uh, journey on Roundtable, we begin by inviting a guest to give a little summary of your journey. We should have had you in a journey home next time we come back. Well, I was baptized in the Norwegian church, Lutheran church, as I think almost everybody when I was a child. Uh, but my parents, they didn't go to church. My grandparents did, or two out of four of my grandparents did. And when I was a teenager, I uh, got into a search about what's the meaning of life. And if there has to be a meaning of life, there has to be a God. If there is no God, there is no meaning. And if there is a God, he is worth searching for. So I, um, and my search for God coincided with my search for the Catholic Church. I actually, I never searched for truth or for meaning outside the Catholic Church. I, I um, always searched for it inside the Catholic Church when I was very young. So I started to go to Mass when I was 15, and I got received into the church when I was 18. All right. And I'm trying to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're we in can. this together, all of us. Yeah. <laughs> now, are you involved also in, uh, in church work now? Uh, for the moment, I try to do my thesis in uh, New Testament studies yes. at uh, Lutheran College of Oslo, actually. Okay. So I try to keep away from church work, but I don't <laughs> succeed. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, thank you for joining us on this panel. Father, I know they've heard your story again, but real quick, a little reminder to the audience. Yes, very quick. Uh, born 27 years ago, uh, baptized in the Lutheran Church. Uh, but brought up in the Catholic Church, mainly by my grandmother, uh, and also uh, sisters, all the sisters in my parish, and especially Sister Bonifacia Wörtke, who passed away just some few years, few day, days ago. Uh, and through them, I got a catechesis, and also great love and passion for the Catholic Church. And yeah. here I am today. Call the priesthood. And your story is a, is a reminder to those grandparents. That they yes, yes, the, the importance of grandparents and the importance of prayer. And uh, I mean, my, my prayer bank sits here. So. <laughs> Sister Annalise. Well, actually, I've known Father Radar since long before he became a priest. Uh, you know my story. Uh, I spent a good few years of my youth in Australia as a Lutheran and got confirmed as a Lutheran. And this was a multicultural and a multi-religious society in the Snowy Mountains. 
And I got shocked at the age of 13 of the split church. I could not understand and even less accept that the church was split. And why was it split? And how, what could I do to <laughs> contribute to United? <laughs> so and to make a long story short, I decided to do like Therese of Lisieux, very pretentious, <laughs> but I, I jumped into the strictest life I could find <laughs> to, to live with Christ <laughs> and to give my life and for the Christian unity. Yeah. And that's, that's my story in a short story. <laughs> Thank you. And that, that's really the topic of our half hour here is this this quest for unity. We want to talk about ecumenism and evangelization. And we just had the first half hour with the panel talking about multiculturalism, which, but really from the perspective of within the church and the challenges for the church. But that also gives a special challenge of ecumenism here in Norway. So why don't we begin with that? I know we've got a short length of time and a lot to say, but how about what's the challenge of ecumenism here in Norway? It's first of all a personal conversion. I think we cannot go into dialogue with anybody without opening our heart, and we need to lose fright. We should not be afraid, and if we are, why are we afraid? Because Christ lives in us and unites us. So uh, I think it's the challenge of John 17 that we should be one, and that Jesus Christ really died that we may be one. And if we are not one, I say that to the Lutheran congregations that I meet from time to other, they come here. And I said, you know, it's a scandal for the world today if Christians don't agree. It is really time for us to stop quarreling between us, to pray together, not to do as if we were one, because we have a long way to go. But it means we have to work theologically, we have to work on our proper own conversion, and then open up to listen to what they have to say. Pray together, and we have done that in London for the past 37 years with the Lutheran congregation next door. And I think we have come to a moment where together we have to open up and listen also to people who belong to other religions. Well, they're spread out all over the place in a, in a parish that's covered a lot of land. Well, I can't but agree. And uh, what I also think of is, for instance, the, commu the community in Tesse who also lives the ecumenical challenge in an, wow. just a beautiful way hmm. where the challenge is in, in a sense baked into unity but also I think that I don't f feel or experience too much of the afraidness that is long since in a sense gone at least as far as I can see but I feel that the major challenge for the humanism is to be theocentric we are so focused on the human aspects, on the anthropocentric mm. world. Well, and I mean, it's quite natural. We are just humans. Yeah. But, but <laughs> at the other hand, to be a Christian is basically also to be able to focus on God. And that is a challenge both for the Catholic Church, but also very much for the other Protestant or maybe also Orthodox churches. But at least in, in our situation where the Protestant church is the main uh, ecumenical partner, in a sense, I feel that the anthropocentric view of focus is very strong, but also within the Catholic Church. So therefore, what we need is, in, in a sense, just like Pope Benedict showed very beautifully at the World Youth Day in Cologne, he pointed at the cross. We are not here to, to say hooray and cheerio for the Pope, but we are here together with him to meet Christ. And that is what also ecumenism is about, but that is what Christian life is about as well. I remember, uh, I think it was his, uh, the Pope's uh, first address when uh, he had been elected. He made a very beautiful address, and he touched also on ecumenism, and he said that it's all about personal conversion and turning to Christ for everybody. And I printed that out, and I gave it to one of my classmates, uh, who is, of course, a Protestant, like almost all my classmates, and he read it and he said, yeah, that's true ecumenism. Hooray for the Pope, he's saying it. Mm -hmm. Is the yeah. state of the Lutheranism in Norway, because it's a state church and everyone's Lutheranism, but it seems to me that a lot of them don't know their faith very well. Are they then open in an ecumenical spirit to hear the Catholic message? Maybe in a way they've it's never had done before. True out, I, I would say yes. But, but again, it's, it's very important to remember that the state church of Norway, or the Lutheran church of Norway, just like the Catholic church, is 
she is so many things at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, when, if you talk about official level with the bishops and so on, of course, you, that's one thing. When you talk about a local parish level uh -huh. or even especially devoted groups within parishes is something very different. So, the, of course, uh, the ecumenical dialogue as such is very confusing. But when you split it up into the various smaller dialogues and meeting points, it's very fruitful. Uh, and probably, I would think, Protestants will feel the Catholic Church the same way, even worse, because she is so much bigger. The word uh, in Scripture, the phrase that to me most describes the kind of ecumenical dialogue that we're to have is that little phrase in Ephesians 4 that calls us to speak the truth in love. Mm -hmm. And to me, that defines true ecumenism, right? Mm -hmm. it, we don't use truth as a cudgel. It has to be with love, but we don't go so far toward love that we sacrifice what's true. It, it, is that descriptive of the kind of ecumenical work you're seeing happening here in Norway? Uh, what we would like to see happen. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I think yeah. you summon up yeah. quite well. Yeah, because, you know, sometimes you get goodwill uh, on false premises, mm. not uh, because they say, oh, so interesting. But what they really say is it doesn't matter. You believe that, I believe that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, we are all Christians. No. And that's not true ecumenism, that's, that's cheap goodwill. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, what is really needed is to, to talk with each other and respect each other as Christians, as, as baptized and as disciples of Christ, and learn from each other what we can learn, but not to, to go beyond this you have your faith, I have mine, and Relatism. everything. Yeah, yeah. because mm -hmm. goodwill often ends up in relativism. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. But I also want to, to add there that, of course, we, we have different roles or positions, things we have to guide. And, for instance, for me being a parish priest, quite often my ecumenical work, if you want to, is to, to pu put down some borders and say that, wait a moment, you as a Lutheran, you can't go to communion in the Catholic Church. One thing is that the Pope has forbidden, but if I when I explain why. Mm -hmm. Because if you really believe that you receive Christ from my hands, you have also accepted my priestly ordination. Mm -hmm. If you have done that, well then be aware, my dear, because then you have long time left Lutheran theology about ordination. Mm -hmm. And of course that, that is quite a surprise. My, in a sense, my job, to put it that way, is to preach the Catholic faith as a consistent faith and the whole of it. Mm -hmm. And that is quite often, that mm -hmm. means that Many Lutherans of goodwill are quite disappointed because, well, maybe time doesn't help and so, but mm -hmm. the, 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 it is really difficult for me to be, be the great ecumenical mm -hmm. spokesman because I have to also defend the Catholic position. That brings us back to one of the keys of, of, of ecumenism. Mm -hmm. If you have the priests in that unique position, mm -hmm. then... As John Paul said in his wonderful encyclical uh, Christophidaeus Laeci, mm -hmm. the front lines of the evangelization are the people, mm -hmm. the laity. Mm -hmm. So if they're going to be um, in those front lines, then John Paul reminds us of something else, which is the re-evangelization, mm -hmm. the new evangelization. Is there a need for a new evangelization in Norway amongst Catholics? Definitely. Yes. <laughs> Definitively. <laughs> Talk <laughs> about that. Oh, yes. <laughs> Everywhere, I think. Yeah. Oh, but... As, as I've been mentioned probably in other roundtable discussions as well, that we are multicultural, we have about 140 nationalities within our own church, there is a lack of catechesis, especially adult catechesis, and we also have a society, the general Norwegian society, where the knowledge of faith is almost next to zero. Mm. Uh, and uh, to put it another way, religion is the only topic in the society where everyone can be a prophet and a doctor. Uh, that, that, that is a difficulty. The, the, the lack of knowledge is just striking, as elsewhere in Europe, of course. And in this, of course, uh, adult catechesis and adult evangelization, a revivification of the, uh, of the baptismal grace is highly needed. Absolutely. There is a in Hebrews chapter 6, there's a section where the author says that he uses the word impossible mm -hmm. 
to bring someone back who's tasted everything, in other words, had the sacraments, learned it all, and then rejected it. And, of course, nothing's impossible with God, so I believe he was speaking pastorally. We know how hard it is, almost impossible to bring someone back. The point is, what about the Catholics? How do you bring back, re-evangelize adults that have been through all the hoops, all the sacraments? They come every Sunday. They may even say the beads. I mean, I say it that way because that's what the way they think of it. How do you bring them back? I think you have to try to transmit the beauty of the faith because um, people who go regularly to church and who, have, who are cradle Catholics, sometimes they don't see the beauty of the Catholic faith. I think converts, we are, all of us once fell in love with the Catholic mm-hmm. faith. And um, this fascination has never ne- left us. We try to maybe be a bit more realistic than we were when we converted. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I always try to. I mean, uh, but this this um, fresh approach. I think I think many cradle Catholics they have never really got this. Gosh, this is true experience. Mm-hmm. They just go on, mm-hmm. and sometimes I think they are very heroic for going on because they are not very well nourished often. They, they keep going to church and they listen to sermons and they try to educate their children and I, I think we could do more for them. Yeah. Yes, I, we, we receive groups here of children being, or young people being prepared for confirmation and it struck, it did strike me that some of them said I am very proud of being a Catholic. And I was very glad to hear that, that young people in their 15s, they want to be Catholic, not just to get confirmed to get a party, <laughs> but because they really want to live as Catholics. And I think you're doing a good job out there <laughs> with your catechism. <laughs> really. <laughs> I, I think basically you summed it up in one word, transmit the beauty of the faith. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe I would like to add, transmit the joy of the faith. Mm-hmm the happiness of the faith. Uh, You can add many more adjectives to this, of course, but just to, if we could transmit the value that the faith can give you, then you have done a great job. And more than anything, I think, especially with, with young people, they need good idols not just these uh, garbage idols you will find out of the street, uh, false idols, but if we, can give, if we can be good examples for the young generation, then we have done a lot already. And especially the sisters, you know, uh, everyone knows I'm Sister Annalise, and everyone knows her smile. Uh, and, and, and she's, just, in a sense, the major nun. <laughs> At least for my, yes, the nun for, 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 for my generation. And, uh, and, and uh, the, of course, that I love the, 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 this, being, this, this being a good example is extremely important. For the adult generation, it is if we could, in a sense, transmit at least some of these valuables, then, then I think we have to be more or less satisfied. Of course not totally, but mm-hmm. it is an extremely difficult job. But the most important thing we have to do is to be good Christians ourselves. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, to add with courses, uh, RCIA in Norwegian, mm-hmm. various sorts of that, uh, adult catechesis and everything. Yeah. You know, Jesus is... One of his most strong uh, descriptions of evangelization is that passage in John 15 with the vine and the branches. You know, you, I'm the vine, you are the branches, we're to produce fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. All of that. Mm-hmm. And when he gets down to verse 11 in chapter 15, and, he's, and he says, the reason I'm telling you this, mm-hmm. he doesn't say so that you're going to be smart. You should, your joy should be full. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's really mm-hmm. it, isn't it? The reason for the knowledge, the reason for everything, is the true joy of the faith. Talk more about that, because I, I, I mean, my point is, we've got people that are watching that need to be re-evangelized, every one of us. Yes. How do we communicate that joy? I don't... I, 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 I don't we have to, to, to people. Yeah. To, to communicate joy, isn't that to put it a bit wrong? Isn't joy right. to be lived? Yeah. And 
what, what, I, what I keep telling my parish is that if you live your faith truly, at some point, some mm. sort of radiation will start, more or less like radioactivity, you know, and that will attract people. Mm. And the reason for it is that we, we had a marvelous Franciscan father uh, here some years ago, Father Hölcher, Ronald Hölcher, and I'm, he was at youth camps. I have seen him dead tired. I mean, he was, at least from, 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 from my point, he was in his 90s. Yeah, as was I was 15, <laughs> he was probably 60, 70. But he could be dead tired, mm. but he always had a smile. Uh, he always had this sort of little bit secretive smile. He had something. And I remember very clearly that I thought that I want to get that. My own parish priest in those days, Father van Furcht, uh, had the same something. Sister Annalisa has it. Uh, and I knew I, I wanted that. And what I see today, especially when I'm working with teenagers and youngsters, they seem to see some of the same in me, even though I don't feel too much of it from time to time. But, <laughs> but, but that, that, that the fact that it, it, it seems to be there and this attraction, blooming attraction, you know, that, that, that is what living the joy is. You know, one of the sisters, uh, Paul Claire's uh, in, in Larrick, Sister Lane, she said, joy is a byproduct. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I think it is, actually. <laughs> it, it is not something you search for itself. It's something that comes if yeah. you have found something else. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. In fact, even in that passage, even the fruit that Jesus talks mm-hmm. about is a byproduct. Mm-hmm. You can't make the fruit happen. You focus on him and obedience to him and humility and, and many of the other gifts come along with detachment and the other aspects of, of the spiritual life. Let's say that we have some of our viewers that, that need to grow in their faith. What would you like to say to them? Where can they begin? They can't make joy happen, but where ought they to begin for themselves and their children? Go to Mass on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, pray to our Father, if possible, every morning, midday, and evening. And then try to search for some good example, some good idols. And read a good uh, Not uh, biography idols. of a saint uh, or something. People do, I want to make sure we don't miss, miss uh, uh, people that are images for us, people that yes, are exactly. models for us. That, yeah. Good Christians that can be a very good model for your Christian life. Yes, thank you. They are. They're, it's just to go look for them. Okay. Thank you. And it's, yeah, it's Hi. also very important to have uh, realistic goals. Don't start in spiritual life. Everything is about having a uh, realistic goal and keep stay to it mm-hmm. I mean don't start thinking that you will pray two hours every morning at five o'clock mm-hmm. because you will manage one day and the next day you will fall asleep may not even manage one day yeah. you know, that's big, too big of a challenge so uh, say to yourself maybe five minutes each day but stick to it even if it's hard and even if you don't have time and even if you think you're tired and yeah mm-hmm. that's the secret stick to it I want to throw the ball back on you because I'm also amazed at the joy and the engagement that the young Catholics in this country show. Mm. I mean, there is an awful lot of work done and you have been working very hard for this message and you live it and you radiate also this joy. It comes from the spirit, I think, Mm. in your heart. But I I really (laughs) admire them because, well, I'm old and I'm stuck in religious life for 47 years and I'm happy. She stuck to it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but you know uh, the joy that you have in yourself uh, it's going to bring you further and it's, it cannot not be communicated to people who meet you oh, I don't know but uh, I never thought about it that way but the, the, <laughs> you know the, the interesting thing in the youth apostolate is that there is an optimism mm-hmm. and this optimism is Of course, we have had our our quarrels and everything as in any youth organization, but the optimism and the joy for fate. Some of the youngsters once said us that, oh, less pizza, more fate. And it it can be said that easily, you know. Uh, They want to focus on the fate. They are proud of the fate. Mm -hmm. They want to live the fate. And for all those who are not that determined... They go along and they see that the faith is valuable, and that is the most important thing. I would have to say, uh, of the many things that I would say to describe my experience here in Norway with all of you, is that there is a, a great optimism and joy that I've experienced in all the guests that I've interviewed on the program and everyone that I've met here in the camp. I mean, I do think this is a very unique place in the world right now. 
and the growth of the church here, very small, small percent, but yet the, the Lord is doing a wonderful thing here. And I want to thank all three of you for your part in that and being open to God's service in your lives. And Father, as we close this program, could we have your blessing? Dominus Obiscum. Benedicat vos omnipotens eterna Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. Amen. Again, thank all three of you, Father and Sister and Heidi. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us on this special edition of The Journey Home, this roundtable from, from Oslo, Norway. I hope that this has been encouragement to you. As they all said, our conversion isn't a one-time thing. It's the day-by-day day, turning away from ourselves and all the other voices to Jesus, our Lord, and being obedient in his grace, in his church. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. See you again soon.